Hi folks and welcome to the ace tanker for the M103, the tier 9 American heavy tank. Uh, this is a tank that I've had for a while um, and um, yeah when I first started playing this tank I loved it. I actually did like the M103 and before you say I'm crazy because very few people like the M103 I'm going to agree with you because as I'm saying when I first got this tank I loved it but only at first because it follows on from the T32 uh, tier 8 and you know the T32 it was decently armored you could play hull down you could use its gun depression but you know the gun on the T32 was lacking as regards penetration so moving from a poor 105 millimeter gun um, with poor penetration to this gun on the M103 120 millimeter gun um, that is actually very very good um, I thought the gun was great and it felt like a huge upgrade from the T32 until I started spending more and more games on this and I suddenly realized that the armor on the T tier 8, you know, is a lot better than the armor on the tier 9. So really the tier 9, the only thing that felt like an upgrade to me was the gun. Um, so the more I played it, the less I liked it. But, um, you know, overall, now that it's aced and I don't have to play it anymore, it's ground through. Um, yeah, I, I don't um, I don't hate the tank. I just don't think it's a very, very strong tier 9. Um, although I will say I still love the gun. So uh, essentially the um, tank, really, the, the reason I don't like it is the armor. And we might as well pop into tanks, GG. You see, the armor is pretty good and it's pretty bad. And we'll start with the lower glacis, and the lower glacis can be penned by most tier 8s and uh, pretty much everything above tier 9, tier 10. You're going to be able to pen the lower glacis, no problems. Now, even if you're in a tier 7 tank who's managed to get into a tier 9 game, you know, you can still pen the lower glacis with a weak gun because you just have to aim a little bit further down towards the edges and you can see that the effective armor on the outer edge, outer lower edge of the lower glacis is down to around 134 millimeters so even a tier 7 gun is going to be able to pen this most of the time so um, you know if you aim center you may have problems but if you know where to aim even a tier 7 can pen this tank from the front so um, yeah it's uh, the lower glacis you know you've got to keep it hidden when you're dr driving a uh, M103 and most most tanks it's going to be facing are going to be able to basically pen the lower glacis so lower glacis not good upper glacis is actually quite good against lower tier tanks again upper tier yeah higher tier similar tier tanks may bounce or they may have problems going through this at the angle it's hit at but um, you'll notice it is a bit of a pike nose it's a round pike nose because this is a tank that was built in competition to the is3 um, and there the up the upper glacis can be effective so the upper glacis is okay the frontal turret is okay as long as people aren't firing premium ammunition but most of the time the frontal turret is actually okay as long as the gun is pointed directly towards you the gun mantlet again okay as long as the gun is pointed directly towards Towards you but as you can see there are areas where you might be able to pen with premium ammunition it depends um, but then you come down to weak armor again which is basically the roof the roof is only 38 millimeters thick now that means that any gun that is a hundred and twenty millimeter or higher 122 millimeter for the Russians 120 millimeter for American tanks any gun that's 122 millimeters or higher is going to be able to, to overmatch the roof armor so You'll find yourself, even when you're hull down, getting penned through the roof quite a lot. And they don't even have to. This would normally be a bounce, but big guns aren't going to be bouncing on this roof armor, and you can hit it from the front. And if they can't hit the roof, they're just going to go for this very, very large cupola. And the very, very large cupola can, again, be penned by tier 7 tanks because it's only 110 millimeters thick. So this is something you've got to stay hull down. You've got to try and use a gun depression. But even using your gun depression, people will still be able to pen your roof armor if they've got a big enough gun. But uh, the other issue I have with the M103 is if you know what you're doing, there is a very, very weak turret ring. You can see the turret ring is only about 140, so it's pretty much exposed across the front. It's uh, if you, the, you're going to head to head, face to face with an M103, uh, go for the turret ring because if you try to go for the upper glacis, you may bounce. If you go for the front of the turret, you may bounce. But the turret ring should be exposed if you're face hugging. So turret ring, again, very, very weak. So frontally, this tank can have good armor at distance, but if you're up against a player with good aim, uh, they are going to be able to pen you if, you if you expose your lower glacis, they're going to be able to pen you if you expose your roof or your, your cupola up here, or if they're face hugging, they're going to be able to pen your turret ring. So being an American tank, you know, it's got strong armor, but it's also got weak armor. And uh, as I say, American tank, it's got weak side armor. You're going to easily be able to pen the side armor at most. It's about 70, 80 millimeters thick. Uh, and then the rear of the tank, you've got absolutely no armor. 
you, most guns firing HE are going to be able to pen the back of a M103. Back of the engine deck is, or the back of the tank is only about 30 millimeters thick. Engine deck's only about 35 millimeters thick. So easily, easily be able to pen this thing. And the other issue I have with this is while frontally, you can see that the turret is quite well armored. As soon as the M103 starts to turn its turret, I mean, even if it's hull down, if it turns its turret even a fraction, it, this may look like a decent slope, but if you aim towards the back of the tank, at this angle, it's okay, but as soon as it over angles, all of a sudden the back of the tank starts to become very, very penable. Um, you know, to similar tier, higher tier tanks. So as soon as you move your turret, you're going to be exposing very, very weak armor, and there's a very good chance it's not going to bounce. So uh, the more it turns its turret, the easier it is to pen. So it's got a very, very weak turret if it turns it at all or tries to angle its turret. So um, really, it's, it's not a really good tank hold down, even if you do manage to hide this lower glacis. So uh, yeah, it's just when you come up against players who know what they're doing, I think the armor on the M103 doesn't work, and that's a problem when you're in a heavy tank and supposed to be fighting on the front line. So the armor can be good or bad, depending on how much knowledge the enemy have. Um, but other good things I liked about the tank is it's got very, very good turret traverse, especially for a heavy. The turret traverse is very, very good. The gun handling for a heavy is very, very good. The gun stats, uh, gun handling, DPM, all quite good for a uh, heavy tank. It's got decent gun depression. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's got weaknesses. I mean, the, the, the downside is the weak lower glacis, the weak frontal armor places, uh, weak spots I showed you, weak side armor, weak rear armor. The top speed of this tank isn't very good. It um, is not amazing. The uh, roof armor and cupola can be overmatched or penned. So, um, you know, I, there, it's got some good points. It's got some bad points. But overall, I think the only thing that makes this gun stand out or make this, makes the tank stand out is the gun, which is exceptionally good. But um, 120 millimeter, 258 millimeters of standard pen, which is enough to deal with most tanks you're going to be facing. Premium ammo gets you up to 300. 40, which is good enough to be dealing with most tanks you're going to be facing. And the HE isn't terrible. It's got 60 millimeters of penetration, so you can deal with lightly armored targets with HE quite effectively. Um, so overall, I love the gun. I love the traverse speed. I love the gun depression. And I love this tank when you're not fighting against players who know what they're doing. However, the tank does have quite a lot of problems. And in real life, this tank had a heck of a lot of problems. But um, we're going to go into the history now, so you might want to skip forward about five minutes. But um, at the end of World War II, um, essentially, America didn't have any uh, heavy tanks at all. They had the Pershing, which is a brand new tank off the production line, but the Pershing was designated as a heavy. Um, and, you know, it, it might have been considered a heavy because it was built to take on German heavies like the Tiger and the Tiger II. But, you know, as soon as the Soviet Union unveiled the IS-3 at the end of World War II, all of a sudden the Americans realized that the Pershing really wasn't a heavy tank with its 90 millimeter gun. It was no match for eight inches of frontal armor on the IS-3. It was no match for the 122 millimeter on the IS-3. So the Pershing was very quickly redesignated as a medium tank. And the Americans started working on a heavy tank, just like the British did, you know, at exactly the same time, as soon as the IS-3 appeared on the streets of Berlin. So um, essentially, the British would end up with a tank called the Conqueror after going through maybe the Carnarvon beforehand. But uh, America would eventually end up with the M103 as a a tank that could potentially take on the IS-3. But uh, development began almost immediately from the end of World War II. So essentially from the end of 1945, um, the Americans began or they started a lot of different heavy projects or quite a few heavy heavy projects. One heavy project was built, built on the M6 uh, heavy tank, which I covered on previous videos quite some time ago now, but that ended up with a heavy tank called the M6A2E1, which is the mutant we have in game. But that was, you know, scrapped. But as, as I say, I covered that uh, on other videos on the channel. Um, another project for a heavy tank was built on the uh, Pershing as using the Pershing previous heavy tank as a Pershing. Um, it was used as the basis for a new line of American heavy tanks and uh, that particular tank ended up uh, resulting in the T-29 heavy tank prototype which used a 105 millimeter gun as opposed to the 90 millimeter gun on the Pershing. However, you know, while the turret armor was good enough to be classified as a heavy, um, essentially the gun, the 105 millimeter at the end of World War II, it was underpowered even compared to the IS-3 it was supposed to be taking on. The hull armor was lacking. Um, so therefore, 
before, the T-29 Heavy never made it beyond prototype, but it did lead on to another tank called the T-32, which again was another prototype, but while the armor was upgraded over the T-29, the turret was changed over the T-29's turret. Um, armor, maybe it could have matched the 122mm on the IS-3, but gun-wise it was still stuck with that terrible 105 millimeter that just didn't have enough penetration to deal with the IS-3. So uh, essentially another project that resulted from the Pershing was the T-30. Now the T-30 heavy tank, heavy tank it's not a TD, um, it was armed with a 120 millimeter gun. Uh, this was a gun that was taken from the T-95 uh, tank destroyer we have in game. The 120 millimeter gun was the first real gun the Americans had in their arsenal that could take on the IS-3 with ease and basically from the T-30 project uh, it led to the T-34 which is basically a T-30 but armed with a 105 millimeter gun but none of these really made it out of prototype none of them were considered serious competitors to the IS-3 so you know and even as the IS-3 was the tank that was targeted by the Americans for a new heavy um Essentially, while they were developing a new heavy tank to take on the IS-3, the Russians or the Soviets released the IS-4. So all of a sudden, you know, America were always behind the curve regarding heavy uh, heavy tanks when it came to the Soviets. But a um, hundred million dollars when the I when the IS-4 was released, uh, the Brit uh, American government released one hundred million dollars to the heavy tank project. Um, this was 1951. Now, they really, really wanted to try and catch up with the Russians. Um, and the $100 million that the government invested in a new heavy tank resulted in a few different prototypes. It resulted in a tank called the T-43 prototype, which would eventually become the M-103. It also a, uh, resulted in a tank called the T-57 prototype, which had an oscillating turret and 120 millimeter autoloader. And we have it in game at tier 10, but it was just a prototype and there was a third prototype built out of that money and that particular tank was the T-58 prototype. Now this is a tank we don't have in game but basically it's a T-57 with more armor, an oscillating turret and a 155mm autoloader. But you know, a 155mm autoloader will probably never appear in game because a 155mm autoloader at tier 10 might be considered a little bit OP, but I suppose that didn't stop the Waffentrucker Alfie 100. But um, regardless, the T57 and the T58 prototypes were dropped um, uh, in favor of the T43 um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, America recently, in 1951, America had just gone back to war in Korea. The Korean War started although it was considered a police action and never called a war. But uh, essentially, even though 100 million had just been pumped into the heavy program, most of the military budget was then redirected to the war effort in Korea. So all the heavy tank projects that were in uh, development in the US were pretty much cancelled. I mean, the T-30 project was cancelled, the T-29, the, the T-34, uh, the M4A2E1 project was cancelled, the T-57 project was cancelled, and the T-58 project was cancelled cancel because there just wasn't enough money. The money was going towards the Korean War and it was also going towards the development of a new medium tank that would eventually uh, come out of the pattern and become the M60. But um, for some reason um, the T-49 project managed to hold on. Even though its funding was cut to dangerous levels, the project was always on the cusp of being cancelled. Somehow it managed to stay alive even though most of the money towards tank development was being directed towards the T, uh, was the M46 pattern at that time. So uh, the T49 basically stayed alive barely. Um, but uh, anyway, so despite the funding cuts, uh, the danger of not having a heavy tank to counter Soviet heavy tanks in Korea and in Europe meant that the T-49 development continued at reduced costs. Now, shortcuts, a lot of shortcuts had to be taken. Um, essentially, they had no money, but they needed the 120mm gun on the battlefield because in Korea, the Americans were worried that there were going to be Soviet tanks involved like the IS-3 and the IS-4 and, you know, even the Patton could not take those tanks on. They were also worried that the Korean War was going to lead on to a new war in Europe, that the Soviet Union were going to invade mainland Europe or, or uh, Western Europe, and as a result there were no tanks in Western Europe at the time that could counter Soviet armour. So even though the project had funding cuts, um, a lot of shortcuts were, were taken in order to get the tank into a uh, development stage. Um, 
the gun was just too important. This 120 millimeter gun was just too important. The Americans needed the gun, even if the tank wasn't particularly good. So as I say, a lot of shortcuts were basically taken in order to continue development of the T-49. Um, so uh, even before the tank reached prototype, the US Army ordered 80 of them because the US Army felt they needed the gun to counter the Russian heavies. The US Marine Corps ordered 220 of these before the tank had even entered prototype. Uh, um, and even before it was tested. Um, so, you know, they needed this tank, even though there was no money in it. And um, when the first prototype was built and arrived in June of 1951, um, it was tested and it was found to have a huge number of mechanical and technological issues. The, you know, too many shortcuts have been taken to develop the tank and it pretty much was, was going to fail the tests overall. So with a little bit of academic you know, rejiggling the, the testing for this particular tank and because the need for it was so great, regardless of how good the tank was, the testing was simplified. A lot of the required tests for American tanks were, were ignored. Um, the prototype didn't go through those tests and uh, basically the tests were simplified to a point where the tank could actually pass, regardless of the huge number of mechanical and technological issues with the armor um, or with the tank. Uh, you know, one of the biggest issues with this particular tank was it was considered under armored compared to the IS-3 and the IS-4 but as I say testing was hurried because the need for the tank with a big gun to counter a Soviet invasion was more important than a tank that worked perfectly so a lot of the, the issues were overlooked you know things like it could only travel 80 miles on a few full uh, full tank of fuel so this tank when it was first introduced could only get 80 miles out of a full tank of fuel um, the weight of the tank even though it was considered under armored, the weight of the tank meant that the top speed of the tank and the acceleration were poor. Um, it was being, you know, the engine that was driving this was the engine that had previously been in the uh, Pershing and then later the Patton. So it was a heavy tank that was far too heavy for the engine and the drive system. But um, as a result, it was it got terrible fuel economy. The fuel tanks were too small. Um, and, you know, the even though it was under armored, adding more armor to this would only decrease the mobility and the acceleration more. So, um, you know, even though the tests were hurried, the tests were reduced to a bare minimum simply to get this tank in production. Um, and eventually the tank passed the few tests. I mean, there were multiple tests that were canceled for this tank, but the few that were run, the tests were hurried. Um, it passed them barely. Um, and essentially Chrysler began building this tank in 1952, regardless of all its issues. So they ended up building 300 of these tanks, as I say, 220 for the Marine Corps, 80 for the US Army, despite all its problems. And the, the tank was built as the T-43E1. However, as soon as the 300 tanks had been built in 1954, uh, the Korean War ended with uh, an armist, or armistice. It uh, actually never ended. The Korean War is still officially under, or underway. Um, but there was an armistice signed in uh, 1954. So the rush development and production of this tank ended up not being needed in Korea at all. So essentially they decided that they didn't need this tank as a hurry. The the situation in Europe had died down um, and they didn't need these tanks rushed to Europe either. You know, a lot of the uh, tension in Europe had eased off. So uh, essentially in 1954, with 300 of these tanks being built, they ended up going into storage because they weren't needed for Korea or Europe. However, in 1956, two years after they had been built, they eventually decided that maybe maybe we've got these 300 heavy tanks sitting around doing nothing. We still have nothing in Europe that can counter the Russian heavy tanks. So in 1956, after two years in storage, just two of these tanks were shipped to Europe for uh, evaluation. Now, one was shipped to the US Army. Um, the US Army in, uh, recommended a range of improvements. Um, and basically the improvements were, were basically rolled out over all 80 tanks that the US Army had purchased or previously purchased. And when those changes were made, the US Army took delivery of their M103. So the T, uh, T43E1 
uh, once it was delivered to the US Army, 80 of them, uh, they became known as the M103. So the Army requested a heck of a lot of changes to this tank that had to be made on tanks that had already been produced before they would take delivery. So 80 of them were shipped to Europe for the US Army. Now, the as I say, two of the tanks were shipped to Europe, one to the US Army, the other to the Marine Corps. Now, the Marine Corps did their own testing on the M103 and they discovered, well, they decided it was terrible. They really decided it was terrible. So uh, even though the US Army had their M103s upgraded to their specifications, the US Marine Corps weren't even happy with the changes the Army had made. The US Marine Corps wanted even more changes. Um, they wanted new turrets. So whole new turrets had to be designed for the M103. They wanted new fire control systems. So a whole new fire control system had to be designed. And overall, between the Army and the Marine Corps, over 80 changes had to be made to the tank before the Army and the Marine Corps would take delivery of their tanks. In fact, when the US Marine Corps had made the changes to their tank, it actually impressed the US Army, who had also already taken ownership of their 80. So they actually asked the Marine Corps for 72 Marine Corps versions of the M103 um, instead of their own 103, uh, M103. So Basically, even the US Army preferred the changes to the M103 that the US Marine Corps had made. So they borrowed 72 of those tanks in the late 1950s and they kept them in service with the US Army uh, and then gave them back to the Marine Corps in 1963 because in 1963 the Army decided to return all the M103s and replace them with M60 patents. However, the US Marine Corps felt that basically the M103, it was okay, it had a big gun it had a gun that was bigger than the patents and they decided to keep their version of the M103s which were the M103A1 was the official name uh, instead of switching over to M60 patents so the US Army basically rejected the uh, uh, M103 in favor of the M60 but the US Marine Corps decided to keep the M103s but they did request further upgrades as basically these tanks even though they've been in service for quite a while even though they've had over 80 upgrades they still had that poor range of just 80 miles. They had power to weight uh, issues. Um, so using the M60 components, the US Marine Corps upgraded their M103 uh, A1s with uh, their new engines, new fuel tanks. They increased their operation range from 80 miles to 300 miles, but it came at a as a result of uh, reduced top speed. So the top speed, which wasn't amazing, used to be 23 miles per hour on the M103, but it became 21 miles per hour on these newly newly upgraded uh, US Marine Corps M103s. Um, so essentially, uh, the M103 had a lot of other components that were basically taken from the M60. Once again, all the M103s were upgraded with M60. 60 parts because basically the US Marine Corps felt it was cheaper to upgrade the M103 than it was to replace it. So the uh, M103A2s, these were the version of the tank that had the M60 upgrades. They stayed in service until with the US Marine Corps until 1974 and the US Marine Corps ended up replacing it with the M60 anyway. So this is a tank that was basically shouldn't have existed. Um, you know, it, it was fortunate to survive the purge of heavy tanks uh, at the beginning of the Korean War through lack of funding. It was fortunate to pass its tests because the need for the gun was more important than the need for a tank. So the tank was developed and produced in th you know large numbers, 300 of them. Even though it was terrible, um, it still survived when it needed a hell of a lot of upgrades from the US Army and then the US Marine Corps. And it ended up staying in service when it basically became an M60 M103 hybrid until 1974. But um, essentially by that time, the US had uh, done away with the concept of the heavy tank. They used the M60 until the Bradley came along, uh, main battle tank. But uh, that's pretty much the history of the M103. So I decided to take this tank out for a game to see if we could ace it. Ended up in a tier 10 game here on uh, Live Oaks and we're just going to go. Now it's not a great game um, and even though I'm a heavy tank, as I say, one of the strengths of the M103, even though it's got, you know, roof armor that can be overmatched and a terrible cupola, is it does have gun depression. It can go hull down and it can be an effective hull down tank against enemy players who don't know what they're doing. And also I found on this map basically this map is won or lost these days on the zero line at least that's my opinion i don't like taking my heavy tanks into town unless they're super heavy tanks but uh i figure i can use my uh 
use my gun depression over here and if there aren't too many higher tier tanks that have gone the zero line then maybe maybe I can bully them as a tier 9 but uh, we're just moving up uh, as you can see we're doing a maximum speed of 34 kilometers an hour so not particularly fast it's not a fast agile uh, heavy tank um, yeah so it's not particularly well armored for a heavy tank and it's not particularly fast or agile for a heavy tank it's better than some I suppose but um, yeah, it's definitely not a medium tank, heavy tank hybrid. So you can see me looking over here, I'm seeing the Conqueror. Okay, so their tier 9 heavy has come over, T57, or object uh, 257. And uh, we're going to go up uh, Centurion Action 10, FV215B. Ah, ah, this is a pain in the butt, but I'm looking at the minimap. I'm seeing that we do have quite a few... Quite a few tanks up here. T-44 is not really an issue. I figure I'm going to push into the uh, corner. Managed to side scrape and bounce that shot. 180 damage, which is okay. But yeah, a lot of enemy tanks up here. But I do have a lot of support behind me. So I figure maybe, maybe we can cause some trouble up here. I'm going to go hull down. My team are advancing into the swamp. So I reckon my rear is fairly covered. And we're just waiting for tanks to move across. So... I don't know what that guy was doing. M103 must have forgotten I was here. You can see me glancing behind because basically, as I say, my rear should be fairly covered. My team are advancing aggressively in the north and we're going for the ammo rack on the FE215B. So, um, yeah, it's a reward tank these days, but, uh, oh, just get penned twice. T110, big, big damage from a 110. Holy cow. He feed for... 463 that's probably the highest possible roll that guy could make but uh, we're going for the ammo rack again set him on fire okay that's all right so again we're bouncing we're staying on the move using my armor I've lost half my health finally my team have moved in but this uh, yeah really surprised the 110 managed to get such a big hit into me and maybe maybe the gun's been changed on that tank I don't know but it seemed very very high but uh, anyway yeah we managed to bounce two and a half thousand damage we're up to 2.2k damage myself um, so we're just going to move up now. There's quite a lot of tanks still here. Yes, yeah, it's going to be difficult to deal with the Conqueror. But as you can see, we're using our hull down. And I don't know where that shot went. And you can see me just... Okay, just got Amorak, just lost all my health. strv 103 b we find out where he is. So now I'm going to be a little bit hesitant about moving up. My team are advancing. Enemy team are dug in. And I don't really want to advance. I'm Amorak, and I don't really want to advance on that... Uh, STRV. So, where did that shot go in? You can see shots straight into the cupola, shots over matching. My turret was turned. You can see that a lot of shots into the side of my turret because it wasn't directly facing the enemy tank. So, what you're going to see me do here is just get an outline on the STRV uh, just to see where he's looking, make sure he's not looking at me. And uh, there is RT in this game, so there are two RT. I'm playing around with RT, but I know that the STRV was over here, go for a blind shot because he wasn't looking at me, but um, our team seemed to be struggling, even though they advanced in strength, now they're all dying, and uh, we don't seem to be doing very much damage to the enemy team, so this is definitely not good. So Cranwagon moving up, okay, STRV is back again, feathering the target to figure out where he's looking. So I have no idea where that shot went, um, I'm getting very unlucky with the STRV 103B here. So he's reversed back down. Is he coming back up? He is. We can get that one in. So 104 or 404 damage. Okay, now we're in trouble because the IS-3 has moved back. He's in danger. Yeah, so I'm not safe here anymore. So we're going to just reverse. I'm looking at the minimap. 257 behind me. Okay, so I'm going to have to reverse, get hull down. and Maybe this guy's going to advance, but he's still got a lot of health. Still a lot of tanks on enemy, uh, a lot of uh, enemy tanks on a lot of health here. And I'm a one-hit kill for quite a few tanks. And there goes another friendly. So all of a sudden, uh, I'm not doing so good. So we can get down here, get a shot in, get a lucky bounce on the side of my turret from the T-44. Um, I'm hoping the rear of my tank is still protected. So this guy is going to cause me a lot of trouble. And he's bounced. That's quite a lucky. He goes for the upper glacis. So I'm going to go face hug this guy because really... The only armor I have is if I face hug, and I'm not going to get a shot in, but yeah, he's, uh, the only thing I'm giving him is my turret, so I'm going to put pressure on the T-44 to stop him from flanking me, and in the meantime, we're going to keep face hugging this guy. I'm pointing my gun into his gun to try and get him to shoot my gun, and he bounces, so I'm going to aim at his roof, overmatch his roof, get a shot in. I'm about to be shot from behind by the T-44. But uh, he gets taken out from behind, so that's fine. My team do cover me from behind. 
and in the meantime you can see me face hugging getting shots into this guy he reverses and the Udes in the middle takes him out so risky shot from the Udes but I don't think I had a choice now if that guy had known what he was doing he probably would have shot me in the turret ring I got up close so he couldn't shoot my roof or my cupola and he couldn't shoot my lower glacis but um, essentially that's it I mean it's about four and a half K damage bounced four and a half K damage done we're coming to the end of the game, only RT left, I'm wondering whether or not I can get a shot here, can't get an outline, hint of an outline, he goes down, the game over. So uh, essentially not ma nothing major here, I went hold down, I put myself into a bad position, I lost a lot of health and um, got lucky with a couple of bounces, but I had to play aggressively, had to face hug, it was the only way, <laughs> only way I'd be bouncing any shots with the M103. So not a fantastic game, I'm still very very rusty, I'm not playing particularly well, I'm not playing particularly often, but we still, we're still able to pick up an ace here and there. So uh, M103, um, it's done, it's dusted, we picked up Steel Wall High Calibre, not a particularly amazing game, 12, uh, 12 and 19 was enough to pick up the ace. I re you know I reckon a lot of players are playing other tanks that are newer to the game these days, so probably a good time to go back and play tanks that maybe maybe are out of favour, but um, 4.5k, just over 45 Okay, damage done. 1219 was enough to pick up the ace. Only managed to pick up one kill. My team did quite well, and we ended up earning a, or making a profit of 42,000 credits with a premium account. So, um, 17 hits received and 13 bounces. Only four actual pens. So, uh, you know, the armor held up, but as I say, if you know what you're doing and you're facing an M103, you can pretty much pen it everywhere all the time. Even if it's face hugging, you aim at the turret ring, you're going to be able to pen it. Um, but if not, you can aim at the cupola or you can aim at the lower glacis so um, get to the side and rear and the tank has no armor either so they're very easy to take out if you know what you're doing um, so anyway that's pretty much it it was a very quick game but probably a long video because I spouted on about the history for quite a while but uh, we ended up with 4,000 uh, XP overall with the premium account and the first win of the day so uh, anyway the M103 is done it's dusted I'm going to wait for a while before picking up the T110E5 because I'm probably going to wait for that to come up as uh, top of the tree before actually purchasing it but um, at least the tier 9 is done and I've got another tier 10 on the, the uh, to do buy list um, so anyway apologies for the lack of videos um, I'm actually very very close to moving in I'm signing a uh, contract to move into a uh, new place on Tuesday touch wood um, and then the real work is going to begin because the new place is as I say over nearly 200 years old and it needs to be modernized so there's going to be a very, very busy, busy period of time in my future. Um, I don't know how often I'm going to be able to get out videos, but I'm hopefully signing a contract for a new place in on Tuesday. And uh, if all goes well and I manage to uh, maybe do up the place sufficiently to move in, then hopefully I'll get an internet connection and I'll be able to get back regularly with regular videos and maybe even some streams. But um, essentially, uh, until that happens, <laughs> I'm kind of stuck trying to release videos where and when I can. But um, um, anyway, if you're still with me, thank you for uh, watching. I'll see you next time.